My name's Doug, Douglas John Shakshaber. I'd go by Shack, John if you know me well, or um, uh, I can tell if you don't know me that well, you call me Doug, so that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll go from the, the, the mid-level next up is uh, Joe Mario's in our team. He's, a, he's an expert with uh, more than 30 years of performance engineering experience. Uh, recently he's been He's constantly dabbling in tools and network performance. It seems to be a very sensitive topic, so those are the, the challenging uh, places in, in both the kernel and clouds these days. Uh, Sanjay Rao is our database expert and disk I.O. and things like that. And where is Larry again? He's, okay. So when Larry makes an entrance, we can all applaud him, okay? Uh, so, so part one, um, we're going to show you kind of an evolution. So I've been fortunate to be able to be at Red Hat now 14 years. Larry will, has been here even longer. Um, but show you how the, the Red, not just Linux and, and Red Hat, but also um, some of the use cases and some of the kernel capabilities have really started uh, evolving, I guess, so that it can be used in all these cloud um, integrated products, um, all sorts of uh, areas that Potentially, you, you wouldn't have thought we would uh, need it, but basically, Linux is a kind of a Swiss Army knife. So, uh, NUMA is non-uniform memory. It's an um, we're going to go through the architecture. Larry will deep dive on what is happening, and here's Larry right now. So, um, he's going to also step you through huge pages and c control groups in the first pe part. So. Uh, just a preview, second part, there will be a time to get up, take a, a short breather, maybe visit the restroom, um, and um, switch over to disk network and uh, maybe touch on a little bit of uh, both the either NFB or some real-time capabilities. So, so with that, I'll just get started on, um, again, this evolution. Um, so how many people here are running maybe Red Hat 6 today. Fair number. That's good to see. I remember. Uh, how about Red Hat 7? Oh, excellent. So this is great. So um, how about Red Hat 3? Any Red Hat 3s? We always have a few. And I usually ask them to escort you to the door, but no. Well, um, uh, how about 4 and 5? I'll just put them together. Okay. So the good thing is some of these slides are still applicable. The bad thing is you're missing a bunch of features, and I think you know that, so we'll try to bring those up. So the areas around memory management and huge pages are going to be studied. CPU, either CPU affinity or NUMA control. So whenever we do this in, and make changes, at least if they take advice from us perf team, is we want to be able to manually tune the Swiss Army knife, but we would also like it to work uh, out of the box without too much tuning if possible. So features like transparent huge pages, um, a NUMA, auto NUMA balance came out in Red Hat 7. Transparent huge pages came out in 6. Uh, C groups and C groups and, and now uh, system D and made essentially containers possible in Linux, LXC. Uh, so in RHEL 7 we have Atomic and, and Docker containers. There's also Cryo, if you haven't heard of that. OpenShift now supports another runtime for containers called Cryo. Um, and then finally, RFQ balance. That's basically where your devices are interrupting and where, where, what CPUs field them. The same thing applies. It's, it's a Swiss Army knife. You have the ability to control which CPUs handle those interrupts and basically try to quiet them down. And as the kernels evolved, we've actually gotten more and more uh, kernel threads to allow some things the kernel would say five years ago, they said, sorry, that's the way the kernel works, you know, we're not going to move flush D demons off of these cores and things like that. But more recently, you'll see we have more uh, user ability to, to push threads and quiet down CPUs for user loads, and uh, some, all of those are, are possible, some of them in seven, and some of them continue to be worked on upstream. So I mentioned TuneD, so what is it? It tries to take what, uh, should have done a count, but the last time we did it, there was like 
I think 480 some tunables that Linux has. So we don't necessarily tune all the knobs because the defaults are chosen usually by the developers and they're auto-tuning for the most part. But there's usually a, another handful of maybe 8 to 10 to 20 tunables that depending on how you set them affects the performance of the system. And so we'll show you some on the right hand column you can see we're allowed to essentially essentially build profiles that are that are really targeted toward different market segments. Um, OpenShift, uh, the newest one, I think Sanjay is one of our Oracle experts, so we're starting, SAP has profiles, so some, some of the applications are now getting very sophisticated uh, to also include TuneDs for, for specific workloads and, and um, essentially databases or Java engines and things like that. So why, why is it? Well, how do you tune for performance? Well, it, it, quite frankly, there's still a lot left up to you, the, the users. So how many people are code and development guys? Fair amount. How many of people are like IT admins running data centers in the world? So, so there's still a lot of control in either dimension, but in the IT space, uh, if you're running on physical bare metal servers today, you basically can do the, use these controls quite, um, you know, as a, uh, as a root person, you're able to do almost any, anything you want, but you usually are either tuning for throughput, I want to get as much bandwidth through, that's the right hand side, that's where the, the lanes of the highway is my analogy, so on a big highway, throughput is more concerned with maybe packing lots of cars on the highway, and guess what? The speed limit isn't necessarily the ultimate fast speed limit, unless you live in Texas, apparently. But anyway, the idea is you're, you're really going from, you know, you're counting basically cargo or trucks worth of stuff through um, your disk I.O. subsystem or your network 10, 40, 100 gig of gigabit networks today. Um, latency is your tuning to let a bunch of cars run like Ferraris and Teslas and stuff and you're allowed to crank up, you know, the speed, but guess what? If you pack too many of those Teslas into the lanes, what's going to happen? Even if you want to try to go 85 miles an hour, you're not necessarily going to be able to maintain that unless you're more lightly loaded. So you'll see the tunables in the kernel uh, are set to, and the profiles were written to, to try to do those two different environments. And so, can you still, t t you know, manually tune all the 450 or, I think it's even more now if I re re recount them, sys CTL parameters, you absolutely can. And in fact, any ones you do, you can actually set a tune D and it'll inherit your sys CTL parameters and merge in the tuning that we think is, is specific toward either latency or throughput. So, so this page has gotten a lot more dense as as more and more products get optimized with TuneDs. These are the ones that we ship and set with our products that Red Hat supports, but as we said before, Oracle, SAP, there's other, there's, there's actually plans for even more um, specific uh, profiles as we start approaching other cloudy-like uh, pro, yeah, essentially environments. So um, you can see the Bottom right here, as we've been working Red Hat, if you've seen in the news, obviously we're working with uh, Telco, mostly NFD around OpenStack, uh, which is virtualized. So, but, but it also, this applies for like maybe financial trading or any places where you might need that first graph I showed of ultra low latency and try to remove as many spikes and things that cause you to be non-deterministic. Uh, so just here's a quick example of setting TuneD um, for an I.O. load before and after, and partly why Red Hat 7 sets TuneD to a throughput is because a simple disk I.O. load can get, um, in this case, 2,500 hits uh, 4,000. So what we usually do is convert that to a percentage. Um, apples to apples comparison, that's maybe about 40%. And again, we get paid in buffalo wings, so that's 40 buffalo wings that the team gets to share in the next outing. Or again, smoothies, 
or even hummus lately because some of us could eat more hummus. Um, two other areas of performance that are fairly recent and relevant to, to all of our customers is, um, is essentially some security mitigations and vulnerabilities that have come up. Um, and the good news is we have a team of folks running lots of different applications. So uh, we often test new vulnerabilities, I guess, any security patches that appear in, in Red Hat goes through the performance team and our QE team. So um, this was a little different because we actually did measure um, performance differences. These were uh, traditionally zero, one, zero to three percent. If it's three percent, the developers help bring us down to nothing. But in this case, um, the Spectre meltdown are the two vulnerabilities we're talking about. And so we were, we were fortunate to be um, some of us pulled in. The way the, this works with security is that while you're working on the vulnerability, you're not allowed to say e the fact that you're even working on it, right? But when it releases, you better have your kernels, your patches, your testing and results uh, ready to go. And at Red Hat, we were pretty excited on day one to be able to patch, uh, you know, greater than 10 different flavors of Red Hat. And also in this case, um, the um, vulnerabilities, we fortunately, the kernel team listened decided to, to, to be able to put knobs in place to, because it could affect performance, just like TuneD can dynamically adjust the tuning on the fly, these vulnerabilities, we can turn on and off the patches. So if you need to be secure, you're going to see Red Hat will always ship, I shouldn't say always, but to my knowledge, we are always going to ship uh, with the most secure options available. So we were going to it, it's, it's not necessarily fix you for vulnerabilities. It's you're mitigating the vulnerability from happening with the best known patches in the industry. And then these patches for Spectre Meltdown are there because essentially as you transition from user space uh, into the operating system or if you stay in the operating system frequently and traversing large memory subsystems, these are uh, the Spectre Meltdown. If you look at the definitions, they were hardware optimizations that were speculatively executing like PTI, page table isolation, is the meltdown down here. Um, the other two for Spectre are around branch speculative execution. And so the, two no the, the three knobs that I was talking about are essentially PTI, IBRS, and there, by March, uh, the community had agreed upon uh, a better technique to help mitigate the performance on a lot of x86 machines using Repeline compared to IBRS. So if these are all foreign to you, you, you don't necessarily have to go home and memorize them, uh, but do understand that your data centers, uh, you have a choice on, we will try to make you most secure first, allow you if say, oh, well, my data center is, you know, in a, in a total secure environment and there's no way. So you have a choice if, if you, if you want to essentially change how much impact that might happen. And so, so we have actually published knowledge base articles on some of the impacts. And everybody asks, why isn't there a specific performance? Uh, so the problem with this mitigation or with this vulnerability is that that data path, it'll depend on your CPU type. It'll depend on your disk storage slow spinning media versus SSD versus NVDIM, right? Uh, networks, it's one gig, 10 gig. So it, it's all a function of, again, how fast the, the rate of change of these uh, user to kernel space on essentially how big are the bars. So again, these red bars were when we call IBRS, that was when IBRS and IBPB are the two Spectre implementations. IB PB doesn't have any performance consequences, but these red bars showed the range of performance depending on, did vary depending on the type of workload. And they were optimized, if you will, with Repeline kernels. Uh, and we sh so we updated our knowledge base with the blue bars here. So this is percentage again. These are negative buffalo wings, which other people owe me now the wings back. So now I'm just kidding. Um, but the bottom line is, if we can keep 
that impact uh, at a lower value. You can see some, some of these offload, network offload technologies, they, didn't, they don't transition often. They're offload. They're not going from the kernel to user space for their I.O. DBDK, Solar Flare, uh, Mellanox, uh, RDMA. So those essentially almost have no overhead at all where, where again, whether it's disk I.O. or network I.O. through the kernel, it still can have an impact. So we can talk one-on-one -on -one about that. Again, there's knowledge-based articles. But I um, don't want to make this purely about that because there's been about a, a full dec decade of a performance enhancements that, you know, are, are on the order of uh, we were just kind of tallying it pretty much between, you know, 8 and 10x uh, gains over the past 10 years. So, uh, And how, how are the gains happen? So remember, the operating system is trying to take your applications and make them work on that hardware, maybe in a virtual machine through a hypervisor, and guess what? The memory to each, each system is no longer constant either, right? So we just showed you how, a, how um, you know, speculative execution can affect performance. You know, well, well, well we got it down to maybe 1% to 5%, uh, but with IBRS, it was up in the 20% range. Well, the NUMA penalty from you, you as an application you know, might be running on this node here, and in fact, there's probably a better, this is the memory interconnect for some of the NUMA systems. This is a four socket system, so check with your hardware vendors on what you're running. If you're running virtualized, that's happening as well underneath at the hypervisor level. Um, and by default, processes will run, and basically the, the memory will get a default, you know, pretty much where did, where's free memory? I'll just allocate you some memory. But if we look at what happens in Red Hat 7 with a NUMA scheduler, it's actually going to try to fill up memory uh, for different tasks, different processes. Uh, it's going to try to give you memory that's local to um, essentially the process that you're running on. So node 1 will fill up here first. And now there are applications and databases sometimes span multiple NUMA nodes because you may want to give Sometimes people give 80% of the memory to the database on a server. So clearly there's ways to, to manage that. So here's another way. Joe Mario helps me uh, show that, in fact, processes and CPU um, without a, a NUMA scheduler are going to basically start uh, pulling data potentially across this. This is not stuff that you notice in your application. It just means it's going to run, you know, whatever that NUMA di difference is in the hardware on, you know, as I mentioned, it was uh, maybe 12% on a two-socket system. As, as you look at four and eight, it gets up in the 20% range. And anytime we can move performance more than 5%, we're usually, with either tuning or optimization, we're usually very happy. And so what are we going to do? We're going to try to end up scheduling those processes on cores, that, and those CPU cores and threads are going to have local memory, meaning the memory is closer, physically closer to um, the CPUs that want them. Uh, so with this, though, what we're going to do is context switch to, to Larry, who's going to tell us about the internals of uh, Linux's memory management. So like, like Jack was saying, the, the goal, as far as the kernel is concerned, is to make sure that the memory and the CPUs are basically on the same node. So you do local memory references versus remote memory references. And just a little high-level description of how the kernel does this. For each node, it's got a pool of memory. Um, this is, I just showed a two-node system. Node 0 actually has three zones, the DMA, the DMA32, and the normal zone. Most of the memory is in the normal zone. Only the first four gigabytes is down in the, in the DMA zones. And then each additional zone has um, uh, just, a, just normal zones. Of memory, the, the the DMA zones are specific for uh, different types of devices. D devices that have either a 24 or a 32-bit mask. They're old legacy devices. Most systems now have the capability of remapping and using higher than four gigabytes of memory. And so, um, and and then as far as the internals of the kernel is concerned, 
every NUMA node has its own memory allocation policy and its own memory reclamation policy, or reclaim threads called case swap D. And this is just a picture of what happens when you allocate memory. You allocate it for either anonymous or for, uh, I'm just kidding, for anonymous, anonymous memory or for file system cache. And it puts it on uh, what we call an LRU, or least, least, least recently used approximation list. And it keeps, it, its goal is to keep most of it on this inactive list so it can reclaim it quickly. So each, each one of these. <laughs> Hang on just a sec. <laughs> Let me get rid of the. I may just turn the network off. All right, we'll go again. All right, back to the show here. Go ahead, Larry. Okay. So each uh, each NUMA node has its own case swap D. They all run in unison and on each node. And so what this means, though, is it, it's possible to get into a situation in which you get memory reclamation swapping and page cache reclaiming on one node but not another. So if you run VMstat, it's possible to see a large amount of free memory, yet the system swapping or, or reclaiming memory at the same time. This causes a performance degradation and there's ways to tune around that. We're going to talk about that. Um, so there's some, so <coughs> as Shaq said before, there are the, these Tune D profiles are filled with tunables, and I'm just going to sort of describe some of the most common ones that you'll find in there, the ones that are do that have the most significant um, results when act, when tuning the system. So there's a group of them that are that are dependent on NUMA uh, on the NUMA systems. These are reclaim ratios. There's one called swappiness, min-free k-bytes, and zone reclaim mode. You'll see these in these profiles. And they actually are, they, the settings of these affect the different NUMA nodes differently. And then we have some that are independent of NUMA, and these are what we call the, um, the other reclaim ratios. These are, these are the, the, what we call the cache pressure and the write-back parameters and the read-ahead parameters. So the first one I want to talk about is swappiness. It's a, in Proxys VM, there's a tunable in there called swappiness. It controls how aggressively the system reclaims anonymous memory versus page cache memory. It's set to an integer 60, and it really isn't a percent or anything. It's just an arbitrary line in the sand. Um, if, if you want the system to favor reclaim them, reclaiming uh, um, page cache memory, which is most common, will decrease the value of this swappiness parameter. So a lot of these TuneD profiles have it set way down to 10. What that means is the system will very aggressively reclaim the, fi the file system cache in lieu of swapping out. And this is to prevent something like a, a database from swapping the, the, uh, the, the global cache or something if it's not wired down. Increasing it will cause the system to more aggressively swap out anonymous memory. So if you have a system or a, an application that wants to keep as much of the file system cache and memory as possible, even at the, co at, at the cost of swapping, you'll see the tune parameters set this. And uh, the, finally, um, th this can affect different NUMA nodes differently. So if you have uh, on, on node one, if you, if you have a lot of file system cache memory, and on node two, you have a lot of anonymous memory, the setting of this will act differently on these two NUMA nodes. And then finally, um, the, the, most people are running RHEL 6 and 7, and, and it's not as necessary to tune this. It acts differently on 6 and 7 than it did on RHEL 5, so it's not as necessary to tune this. Automatic tuning, we've done a lot of work in automatically tuning the system. But on older systems, it, it was more necessary to set some of these parameters, including swappiness. So the, the next one I want to talk about is the, the free list uh, watermarks. There's three watermarks, um, high, low, and min. When the system boots at the beginning of time, it throws all the memory onto the free list. And then um, so the, all the memory is on the free list. We do absolutely nothing in preparation of running out of memory until the system gets, th until the free list falls down below this pages, actually, but falls down below pages low. And when it falls down below this, below this value of pages low, it wakes up a background daemon that asynchronously flicks out pages. This is called k swap d. It reclaims 
page cache pages and or anonymous pages based on the setting of that swappiness. And if the if it can keep up with a system demand, it just bump it just reclaims enough memory to get you up to pages high, and it just waits for the free list to fall down below low again. However, if you overwhelm it, there's only one kernel thread per, per NUMA node called kswapd, and if you overwhelm it by several user processes going in there and lunging at memory at the same time, it'll go all the way down to min. Once it hits min, every process becomes kswapd inside the kernel. Before you can allocate a memory, page of memory, you have to go out and reclaim some memory, and this is what prevents, this is the, the real cliff that prevents the system from really getting backed into a corner. So, so, so has that happened to anyone here? Anybody hit swapping? <laughs> it happens to everybody. Okay. That's why he's saying that. <laughs> okay. So this, this min-free k-bytes is actually tunable, and you can, uh, you, you, it's, um, it's one of, the, one of the tuning parameters that you will see in uh, uh, the TuneD profiles. And you can, in basically what happens is you can set it manually by echoing a value into the, the min free k bytes. And what this does is it distributes this number of kilobytes. It's in kilobytes. So if you need, you know, megabytes or gigabytes, it's going to be a large number. It distributes them evenly among the NUMA nodes. But when it comes to node zero, as you can see, node zero is different than the other nodes because it consists of three zones. It divvies up that number between those. But you, as you can see, the difference between, um, when, when basically I think what I did is to double this. And you can see it just went in and set all of those, those watermarks higher. You don't want to randomly set it to some huge value because it's like removing memory from the system. If you set it to half the memory on your system, what would happen is it would it would allocate half the memory on your system, then it would kick off kswapd, and kswapd would start reclaiming memory, and you'd never go below something like half or a third of the memory on your system. So you want it to be as low as possible, but high enough so that you don't fall off a performance cliff. And we'll talk about this as a, that's what the TuneD profiles do is they figure out what what level they should they should be set at so that the performance doesn't drop off a cliff. There's another tunable that you that you see set all the time. It's called zone reclaim mode. And this controls what to do if the system runs out of memory on one node. So you're on one node, if you allocate a page on the node, it this setting determines if you step onto another node and do a remote memory allocation or you just allocate it local local to the to the node you're on. And the choice of this is, it's, it's not a very easy thing to decide. And so what we do is we look at the, um, the memory timings between the, between the NUMA nodes. And if it takes, if there is a significant amount of delay in the inter-node memory reference, we tend to set this so that it will reclaim locally on the node versus jumping onto the, the other node and allocating. So what this does is it's a, it's a trade-off between the startup time of a process and how fast it runs during runtime. So if you, uh, on a system that has like a database, it's going to be up for, you know, forever, hopefully. Um, what you do is you would set this parameter so that it would reclaim memory on the node when it allocates it so that it would, it would tend to, uh, it, might, it might tend to take a little bit more startup time, but once it's up and running, it's doing all local memory allocations versus remote memory allocations. So as you can see, it's controlled by Proxys VM zone reclaim mode. A one reclaims from the local node versus allocating it from the next. A zero does just the opposite. Um, and the, de the default actually changed back in the 6.6 to 7 time frame. And the reason that it changed is because the upstream community started to realize that the cost of doing local memory, for two reasons, the cost of doing uh, reclaiming on the local node was expensive enough where it was noticeable on startup. But the other reason that it was turned off is, like Jack was saying, we now have uh, auto -numa, um, an auto NUMA system which balances stuff out. So even if we allocate on the wrong node, the, the NUMA balancing code will actually migrate the pages over eventually over time, and you'll be doing local memory allocations anyways. There'll be a performance penalty at startup, but it'll, but it'll eventually shake itself out. Um, do you want to go back and talk about this? Sure. Yeah, so there are definitely a, a set of tools, and we aren't going to go through 
a very large list of tools, but the ones around NUMA, we'll just briefly go through. There um, is a tool that you can install, or I believe it's de installed by default called LS Topo. You know, and there's character cell uh, output as uh, well, but you can see they actually do share your topologies, both of the CPUs and the cores and the caches. So you get the cache layouts as well. Uh, you get the multiple NUMA nodes. If, if you're, this is a two socket system, uh, you can also see the, where the PCI devices. So again, this is the OS view. So you don't have to go to your BIOS and dump out information. You don't have to, you know, go look up the specs on what you think you bought and from your vendor. And because it's actually good practice if you guys are setting up, uh, whether it's for um, bare metal, virtualized, virtualized, you know, if you're responsible for those setups with either VMware, KVM, Rev, et cetera. Um, these, the, the most recent things that we're seeing in performance is understanding where your high speed devices, as I said, when you get up to 40 and 100 gigabit networks, this sort of matters. And that if this was on one socket here and all of your mission critical application is running over here on NUMA node one on these cores, uh, today there's not an auto scheduler. We do have IRQ balance trying to do things, and it is uh, more NUMA aware, uh, n not necessarily 100% perfect, depending on the loads, but it should try to put, try to schedule these things locally uh, until, once again, until you, if you have so much load on the system, we're not gonna just keep uh, CPUs essentially sitting idle, so you will see them spill over eventually. But this is also something you can control uh, by turning off IRQ balance and, and manually setting, you know, the interrupts and things like that. Um, another useful tool is LSCPU. It, it both dumps out, uh, again, your cores, how many, you can turn cores online and off, right, without rebooting. You can say, oh, I don't, I wanna see what happens in these what if games, hopefully, maybe not on your production environment, please, but on uh, experiments you might wanna run. Uh, you can see how many sockets you have and things like that, and then in fact, you can see this is a, a question we get asked a lot is like, wow, I got this, you know, in this case, a 40 core ma machine, 10 cores per socket. And I thought it was one through nine or zero through nine is the first CPU. And, one, and, and look at, depending on the BIOS and the hardware vendor, that these numbers are not actually necessarily in this order. Uh, there's some vendors, I think HP is odd and even for, you know, threads and hyper threads. And so, I mean, you get, you get different combinations. So uh, LSCPU is, is a good tool to, uh, to really go understand your hardware. And then finally, NUMA CTL. Uh, NUMA CTL shows you, again, the, the core layouts on a socket by socket. It shows you also, the reason it's called NUMA CTL, because it's also gonna show you it's not you know, your pinning isn't just CPU affinity anymore. It's, it's where is your CPU and where is your memory and eventually where is your I.O. So um, knowing those things or, or trying to optimize those things is how you can be. There were command line heroes over in the booth I saw. We should probably propose a performance hero award for the next summit maybe. Uh, and then finally, the NUMA distances. So this is read off the split table, right? And um, essentially is like, this isn't exactly every nanosecond, you know, this isn't in microseconds or nanoseconds, this is a, um, a relative difference, right? So the distance here of any given core to a different core, this can get big in eight socket machines, you can have multiple levels of distances and uh, depending on the architectures. This, uh, um, before when I was saying that the setting of that zone reclaim mode is based on this table. So this table, if the difference between the local and remote is large enough, the system will automatically set that zone reclaim mode to one so that it'll, it'll do local memory allocation instead of remote. And then, so finally those were like how to display stuff. Now how, how can we control it? So NUMA CTL is a way to control it. I know this is an eye chart for you guys, but there's actually four different interesting use cases, and I'll leave that as homework, and there'll be a quiz at the uh, ex Meet the Experts later if you guys wanna 
earn your own buffalo wings. But the idea is you can set things, uh, bind things, you know, on a node by node basis, on a CPU basis. Um, you can actually interleave some of the nodes together. Say you had a database taking four out of eight sockets, and wow, did I have to just, is it all or nothing? Can I, you know, well, hey, give, give four with an interleave across those four memory banks, and things like that um, are all doable. And um, once again, as, as we migrate things to the cloud, we hope Autonuma Balance can do a good enough job in, in one respect. But then as soon as we get things really automated, we find, oh, the telcos want to pin it down and control it every, every bit of determinism because they can't afford to drop a packet because actually they're going to bypass the kernel network stack anyway with DPDK. So there's no, so send receive is very important, but they can't have disruptions. Quick chart of, um, so on the left side here, these PIDs are QMU-KVM. Yes, each of these processes are actual full KVM gas. And the nice thing about KVM, a process can get managed by the scheduler, by NUMA seats, the same tools. You don't have to relearn a different set of tools if you want to optimize them. Uh, so you can, you can either manually pin these to the different NUMA nodes. In this case, we, we actually had, this was a test for the auto NUMA scheduler. And you can see the bottom chart is a much better scheduler that this, these four guests are actually nicely distributed. There was enough memory in the, the host so that they almost all got local memory. And then you see this one node, this little guy here was, why are these five, five pages of, of memory? Well, there are shared libraries on a system. And so we're not necessarily, we don't replicate the shared libraries to each NUMA node. So there are some pages that, um, in the current implementation, you know, that we aren't going to be able to redistribute all the memory to every, every process, you know, if you're using shared memory. Actually, just one thing to say, shared memory and NUMA do not cooperate very well in general. They, like Jack says, we don't replicate the read-only shared memory on all the NUMA nodes. There's only one copy of it. And when it comes to the real shared writable memory, there's really nothing you could do anyway. You've got to allocate it on one node, and then whoever's running on that node benefits from it, and whoever's not running on the node is going to pay a, a cross-memory reference cost. And, and th so they don't really cooperate all that well. They never have. The only thing that solves it is a larger cache in hardware. Yep. And so uh, if you're on six, you were saying, well, we have no tool to. So that was seven. A bunch of you guys were on six. To me, on five, I can't really help you there, but on six, we do have a, a NUMA D um, user space team, and you can, yum, uh, you can install a, a NUMA D, it's called, and because at that point, the kernel, uh, it's, it's not as efficient. It doesn't do it at schedule time. It does it at uh, user space, but it basically goes out, looks at your process and how much memory, and it literally will move that process and its memory you know, to a NUMA node, so that initial startup cost can sometimes be a little higher than, you know, so you might, might notice some uh, transient time. And uh, if things are coming and going frequently, it's, again, a user space. It's not doing it at schedule time, but uh, pretty, pretty interesting tool. Um, let's see. So let's just look at some charts, and this is proof that we don't have very good slides because we grabbed a picture and jammed it in there, and it's fuzzy. Sorry about that. But the idea as this Java engine, you know, without any NUMA capabilities, as we scaled up our workload for more warehouse counts, this is the lower bar here, and the throughput in uh, the BOGO ops is spec JVB, right? And so if we can NUMA D and Red Hat 6, we got the blue bar here, and you got a, a really nice improvement in performance. And then finally, NUMA control and auto NUMA, you know, we were trying to, you know, our team, we try to beat the scheduler. And of course, the scheduler team t tries to make us obsolete. And, you know, maybe we aren't going to be here next year. But the bottom line so far is that we continue to try to have uh, some NUMA control edge here uh, that um, there's still performance opportunities. Uh, likewise, I don't know if Sanjay wants to go through uh, what's going on with the Oh. Uh, I think I could just come in with uh, a quick fragment and, you know, taking advantage of the affinity that many uh, all workloads benefit from it.
it. In this case, uh, we have four uh, virtual machines running database workloads, and you see with proper number alignment. And, and one of the things that you saw in the chart also was as the system gets busy and there are more processes trying to access memory across number boundaries, uh, they will be penalized. And uh, as we get busier, uh, just normally I, I run my workloads in a fashion that you know we start with the lower and then we ramp it up so we can kind of observe both ends of the spectrum. You can clearly see the more we lean towards high user mem uh, memory usage and high user count, uh, we get about uh, I thought about 15 to 20 percent gains uh, by using Numa Affinity. Thanks, Sanjay. And so now I'll turn it back to Larry, and he can tell you about the architecture around huge pages. So, um, so the, the as far as huge pages are concerned, the so the Intel architecture, which is dominant, I'm sure I'm almost. Is anybody here run anything but the Intel architecture? Do we have a few other what, just arms or or uh, whatever architectures, power. Um, so this, it, in talking about the, the Intel architecture, there's basically there's three page sizes architected into the thing. There's a 4K, a 2 meg, and a 1 gig page size, and we support all of them. Um, so there's a, there's a couple different mechanisms of using large pages. There's transparent huge pages, which is automatically used for anonymous memory uh, in all cases, as long as the allocation is at least 2 gig, two megabytes in size, and it can get a two megabyte alignment in there. It allocates a two megabyte page, and it uses the hardware assist to map the two megabytes with a single TLB entry. Um, so if this just shows you the performance difference. If you shut off PHP and run, the, run a little memory test program that I, ra I ran, you can see it takes 11.4 seconds. If you turn it back on, you can see it runs in six point, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, in 12 versus seven seconds, so you get about a 56% performance boost on that. There are times, however, which um, transparent huge pages is the wrong thing to do. If you have a large, sparse virtual address space, if it's an application that has, you know, a very large address space but touches very small random places in there, and we have Tundi profiles that tune for this, they'll shut this, this thing off because it'll instantiate two megabytes when it only needs a couple of bytes or something. It's clearly the wrong thing to do. The same thing is true. It, there's actually system overhead associated with transparent huge pages where it will actually uh, move pages around and, and migrate what we call migrate pages in order to prepare to have enough large pages available so that the allocator can get them. Um, so the, the other mechanism is um, for System 5 shared memory and for a uh, huge TLBFS, which System 5 shared memory is layered on top of, there's a standard manual two megabyte uh, huge pages, and you control this by echoing a, n a number of them into Proxys VM and our huge pages, and you can see, if you look at the meminfo, you can see it allocate them, then I wrote a little program that used them, and you can see it actually use them, and uh, and this, this is how you use, so s databases typically take advantage of this via System 5 shared memory. Um, and then finally, the one gigabyte huge page, which is a really, obviously, this is a really large huge page. In terms of terabytes, it's not all that large, but in terms of a, you know, system with hundreds of, of gigabytes of memory, it's a substantial percent of the system memory. And um, you can see how you can allocate this stuff at boot time or you can allocate it at runtime, but you can see in, this, in the top line, the boot arguments uh, to set up the, the huge page sizes and the number to allocate, and it, and it reserved eight gigabytes of huge pages, and I wrote, wrote this sim silly little program that would mmap via huge TLBFS, and you can see that it's actually using them there. Um, this, the, now this, the, so as far as how this interacts with NUMA, there's another interface to this so that if you want to allocate the huge pages on specific nodes, you can do it through the sys file system. And uh, the, uh, you can see here if we allocate using the, 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 the proc file system, we allocate, uh, say, a, a thousand of these things. It puts 500 on each. It divvies up evenly through the NUMA nodes. It puts 500 on each of them. But if you were running uh, an application and you wanted all of them allocated on node zero instead of node one or vice versa, you would go through the sys file system. As you can see down 
the, in the example below, what I did is I said I want to allocate a thousand of them on node zero. And in this particular case, when uh, I, I did a cat of the the, um, the huge pages in the um, in the sys file system, you can see that all thousand of them were allocated on node zero, and none of them were allocated on node one. Um, this is just a, uh, um, a performance. I think this is up No, no more. Uh, so here you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm running the same thing, the database workload, Oracle uh, instance. And uh, typically, you know, I mean, uh, there are various recommendations out there. What should be the size of the shared memory segment? And uh, we've seen several instances where people uh, allocate 80% of their system to uh, database shared memory. And in this case, what happened was when I was ramping up my user account, I got to a spot where, it, where things started swapping. And uh, as you can see, at the red bar clearly shows that my performance just fell off a cliff uh, when, I, when I increased my user count beyond, uh, beyond 80. And uh, 80, it, these are user sets, by the way, not just 80 users. Uh, otherwise, that would be pretty dismal on a large system. Uh, but one way to fix that was, and we actually addressed several customer uh, situations where we found that they were over-allocating their shared memory. So we told them to take it down. So you can see from 24 gig, we took it down to 20 gig, and we were able to continue scaling. But uh, but by using huge pages, which Larry just mentioned, uh, one of the benefits of using huge pages is it, it pins the memory, it, the, so the swapping doesn't touch. So especially for databases that support huge, huge, huge pages, you should definitely turn them on and use it. You can see not only do we get performance benefits, uh, but if you see the orange bar there, it is a 24 gig SGA, and that doesn't swap. And you continue to scale, you get performance benefits of huge pages, and you don't even uh, go into swapping space. some slides around, so that's why. Uh, but anyway, uh, case in point, again, if you start swapping, it really affects performance. In this case, I can continue to wrap up my user count, and you can see that uh, you know my performance is half of what it would be if I was using huge pages. And one more question I frequently get is, uh, uh, if I replace my swap disk with a solid state device, right? I mean, solid state devices are fairly common these days. So people think, uh, maybe I can replace my swap, and that way I can probably not incur that kind of penalty. But that's not necessarily true, true because uh, swapping is a very old mechanism, and the way it, it doesn't do things uh, block by block. It, if it sees that a process is running out of space and if it needs to move things out to swap, it'll do by chunks. And so the whole process itself is, is so expensive that it really doesn't matter what type of device you use. I was using a, a Optane SSD device for it, and as you can see, really I did not benefit, uh, you know, uh, performance-wise I did not benefit by using a faster device for my swap. Like one other thing to just say about this is that use, the use of huge pages wires memory. It gets the kernel completely out of the picture, too. And that's why you get one of the reasons you get such a performance boost. Yeah, so, so we are running short of time, as usual. We have more slides then. So one, if you're trying to attend a different session, feel free to go ahead and hop up and leave if you need a medical emergency, of course, do the same. Uh, but otherwise, we're actually going to kind of keep rolling a little bit. Uh, I will give another. Larry says he's got five more minutes here, and we'll give you a five-minute bio break. So, so it's, it's, I'm just going to whiz through this uh, um, C group stuff fairly quick. So, C groups is the f the foundation of containers. For it's the kernel's building block that all of the containers and and uh, uh, so for the build on top of. So this is just tells you how, where the mount points are for RHEL 6 and RHEL 7. They're different, so obviously the tools have to be slightly different. Um, this is just that, so what, you, what C groups allow you to do is they allow you to subset a system. They allow you to take a large system and break it up into smaller pieces and dynamically and expand it, contract it on the fly. And this is just a really simple old example that they put together of how to create a 2 gigabyte 4 CPU subset of a 16 gig 8 CPU system. You can tell it's pretty old based on the size. And these are just the instructions that I did on RHEL 6, um, mounted the C groups, uh, made a test directory in there, and then set the, this MEMS is the NUMA node. So I said I want to create a subset that is on node 0. It consists of CPUs 1 through 3 and 2 gigabytes of memory. And then this echo task says every process that I fork hereafter from this parent becomes a member of the C group. And you can see here, as all this shows, is that when I run a program that has, say, 110 processes, 
it binds them, it only runs them in that C group. You can see in uh, CPU 0 to 3, it only runs them in that C group. It doesn't touch the remaining part of the system. And I think um, as I show this, what's going to happen is uh, I, I just wanted to say when, when I do this, if I allocate more than the two gigabytes that's specified here, the system will start swapping on that node, on that C group, and not affect the rest of the system at all. So if you have a system, if you have a system that you really want to dedicate to, say, a database or something like that, but once in a while you have to get on there and do something in the background and you don't want to hose the database with it, you create a little C group here or a container, so to speak, which is a subset of the system and it won't affect the rest of the system. Um, and, and C groups also allows you to, has a lot of NUMA control. You can control, completely control the, the system NUMA wise with C groups. So what I show right here is that same example that I had before. If I, if I say that I want to allocate on node zero, I want to allocate the CPUs that are on node zero, and I run this little program, you can see that, that all, the, all the memory references are local. In other words, the NUMA hits go up from, what, 1.6 million to 2.7 million, but the misses really don't change at all. And then on the, on the, to contrast that, if I go in and I say I want to purposely break the system, I want to run the CPUs on a different node that the memory is allocating on, just the opposite happens over to the right with the incorrect bindings. You can see that the hits don't change at all, but the misses go, go up through the roof. So, and as a matter of fact, if you look at the time that it took to run the program, you paid the penalty. Instead of taking 1.6 seconds, it took almost two seconds because of the remote memory access is associated with it. Um, these are just two other s controls that you have in the CPU, in the uh, CPU C groups. You can control how much of the CPU that um, a given C group gets. Shares, what shares do is it allows you to, it's, you start out with 1,024 shares in a C group and you can specify Say, for instance, you wanted 1% of that. You can specify, oh, I only want 10 shares to go to a particular C group. And using this, this shares model, if nobody else is using the CPUs, it lets it go all the way up to 100. But if somebody else starts using the CPUs, it takes 99% of them away from that one with the 10 shares and gives them to the other, to the other CPUs. I'm, I'm sorry, the other C groups that are running. You can see that over... Um, on the right side, it's kind of an eye chart, but you can see that it only gets 1% of the time versus on the left side, when you have 1,024 shares, it divvies them up evenly among the C, among the, the C groups. And then finally, the, the other one that I want to talk about was the, the CFS scheduler. In the CFS C group scheduler allows you to do the same thing, but regardless if if anybody else is using that, the CPUs or not, it limits it to whatever you set it to. So you can see that as, in the ca this case, the, the programming interface is kind of weird, but you, you, it, it's got a period in terms of microseconds and a quota. And if it's unlimited, you can see it gets 100% it gets of the CPU time. But if you say, I only want it to have 1%, regardless if the CPU is idle or not, it only gives 1% of that, that C group of the CPU to that C group, even if the whole system goes idle because of that. This is just to talk about oh, how OOM kills work. If you set the uh, memory, if you limit the memory with a C group and you run out of memory and swap space on a C group, even though the system itself has plenty, it'll OOM kill, just like it was, a, just like it was an overcommitted system. Um, it, this is just details that show you what the output of the D message will show you, and it'll specifically tell you that it was killed in result of a limit. It, it, that, that, that message in the task in slash test kiz, it killed as a result of limit of slash test. Slash test was the name of the C group uh, that I created. Um, this just is, I don't know if you wanted to talk about this, Shaq. This is just uh, application. Yeah, so, so we'll probably wrap up this half, I think. Yep. Um, but, uh, but again, uh, Sanjay again helped show essentially over time, uh, I believe the, it's the red database yep. that basically got um, started swapping. And a lot of times in the past when you ran four databases or 100 databases, one guy swapping could spoil the whole, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, right? But in this case, he, the red bar 
who's running slower performance was swapping and he got reduced performance, but he didn't hurt the other, the green, orange, and blue bars are all still running at full throttle. So it's an important thing. People use this quite frequently. Um, so again, just in summary, this half, we went, tried to share with you uh, capabilities. By the way, RHEL 5 and 4 do have NUMA CTL, do have NUMA control and things like that, uh, NUMA stats, so a lot of the stuff. But we, some of what we shared in RHEL 7 obviously has auto NUMA balance and, and transparent huge pages. So we're not going to take the controls away, uh, but we're also going to key, allow, hopefully, more usage. And so you guys, anyone running in a cloud, a public cloud, and, and anybody get a VM? That why is my VM yesterday it was fast and today it feels sluggish? Or, or maybe you don't get that level of uh, granularity. But what, what happens here, depending on the cloud vendors, you can see the C group scenarios Larry shared are part of what System D came out to control CPU shares, memory, things like that, so that you can basically, um, you basically can manage um, multi-tenancy. So pods and, and containers are just processes, just like VMs. You know, people can run uh, on these larger servers now, tens and hundreds of, of uh, VMs and, and pods. You can run thousands or you know, hundreds of thousands of pods. So. So that's the technology behind the scene. And thank you very much, folks. We'll, uh, if you are coming back, um, we'll restart again in about uh, five to 7.2 minutes.